day you had a barbecue and you didn't invite me hurt my feelings ladies and gentlemen he is the captain i didn't want any of your stinking barbecue anyways it's good to be seen and it's good to see you thanks for listening thanks for telling the friend Tonight we are featuring Kiwi Peach Sour Lina from Firehouse Brewery in Charleston, South Carolina. Garage grade three and a half bottle caps out of five. Kiwi Peach Sour Lina is sour, tart, light, sweet, and fruity. Everything one would want from their sour ale. ABV 5.7%. And this beer was brought to us by, first up, let's go out west and say cheers to John in Wilsonville, Oregon. And a big shout out to Teresa in McLeansville, North Carolina. Next we have Tricia, who's sending some garage love from Texas. And also a shout out to Brittany, who wants to slam some purple drink with us if we ever find ourselves in SoCal. Mmm, tasty purple drink. And a big shout out to Mara in Toronto, Canada. And we also have Trick McMichael in Volo, Illinois. And last but not least, a cheers to Scott in beautiful downtown Burbank, Illinois. Thanks, everybody, for helping us out with this week's show. If you want to help out with next week's beer run, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. B W E W R U N beer run. Hey, and be patient because we are behind on the beer shout outs. So cheers to y'all, mates. Cheers to you, Captain. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. On the day after Brittany was last seen, this is Sunday, April 26. Don, John Greco, Don's parents, and two friends drove down to Myrtle Beach to look for Brittany. Police in Myrtle Beach also started the search. Large-scale searches began very quickly. They were fanning out from the Blue Water Resort. Police saw that there was no activity on Brittany's bank accounts or her credit cards. Don and John and others canvassed the town, handing out flyers with Brittany's picture. Her description was publicized. Brown, shoulder-length, straight hair and blue eyes, last seen wearing a multicolored striped shirt, black shorts, and silver flip-flop sandals. Myrtle Beach PD requested that anyone with pictures or videos from, from South and Ocean Boulevard between 8.45 p.m. and 9.15 p.m., on April 25th, that they please contact the police. So they're going to start their search, Captain, from the last known spot that we know that Brittany was, at the Blue Water Resort, leaving Peter's room. And they're going to ask anybody that, you know, it could take her half an hour, let's say, roughly, to walk that route back to her hotel. Mm -hmm. Anybody that took pictures in that area or filmed anything with their phone at that time, give us a call. Because we need we need eyes. We need to see what was going on in that area at that time. One of the things law enforcement was, is going to be fighting is the fact that a lot of the people that were there the week Brittany was there probably left on that Sunday and might never have heard of this girl going missing. You're correct. And the early searches will provide little to no information as to the possible whereabouts of Brittany Drexel. By May 2nd, Dawn, her mother, had appeared on Nancy Grace appealing to the public for help. Investigators had shifted their investigation to 40 miles away. This is in Georgetown County. The press reported that this was due to tips received, and that may be the case because now we know that two days after her disappearance, Myrtle Beach PD, who has described Brittany as a, quote, heavy cell phone user, was able to obtain Brittany's cell phone records. And what they found immediately moved the investigation to a high-priority endangered missing persons case. Brittany's phone had pinged at 9.27 p.m., so 29 minutes after her last text to her boyfriend, John. Now, this, this ping was heading south on Route 17 in Surfside Beach, seven miles south of Myrtle Beach, at a speed indicating that she was in a vehicle. Mm-hmm. Even more distressing, police saw more pings, one at 10.18 p.m. and one last ping at 11.58 p.m. These were off Tower 332, which is 50 miles south 
in Georgetown County near the Georgetown and Charleston County line, close to a boat landing on the North Santee River. And this was very concerning to investigators. This was an area that was dark, rural, and swampy. The fact that Brittany's phone had been in Myrtle Beach at 9 p.m. and then beelined to this godforsaken area within just a, a few hours did not look promising for Brittany. Police set up a search grid in the zone covered by Tower 332. This is roughly a four by five mile area. They're also going to be searching areas around this spot. They began a massive search operation. Searchers used boats with sonar. They used helicopters, dogs, horses, and ATVs. Now, this is an alligator-infested area, along with wild boars and poisonous snakes. Investigators were not optimistic about finding Brittany here. Apparently, they warned that if Brittany or her remains were here, they would likely be consumed by wildlife within six hours or less. After 11 days of exhaustive, round-the-clock searching, Brittany's family returned to Rochester. Chad Drexel describes having to tell Brittany's siblings, one of whom was only five at the time, that they had failed to bring Brittany home. Now, there were a couple theories early on in this investigation. As far as public information is concerned, nothing happened on the case for about eight months. Police were convinced that the answers to where Brittany was lie in the cell phone location or in the cell location. They cleared Peter and Brittany's travel companions off of the persons of interest list. And Don Drexel was not happy about this, as we had said. Two new theories, though, began to emerge around this time. Let's touch on them because they are still supported by some to this day. The first is that Brittany was invited along on this spring break trip because these supposed friends of hers wanted to use her as a drug go-between. A few things support this theory. We know that Brittany was only 17, so a minor. The others were all legal adults at this time. If she, if Brittany were caught with drugs in her possession, it wouldn't be that bad for her in comparison to the adults. Now, as far-fetched as that sounds, this could make some sense, though. We know that, that Brittany told her boyfriend that these kids were using drugs. Right. Myrtle Beach is known to have a drug scene with drugs readily available in, in some of the shadier locations. It's part of the scene, man. We know that these girls were not particularly nice to Brittany, nor did they seem to care about her well-being. There is some thought that the whole issue between Brittany and Jen regarding the shorts was actually some kind of code and that the texts were about the, you know, not about the shorts. They were actually instructions for Brittany to go outside and meet a drug dealer that presumably was waiting for her and, and bring the drugs back to them. Right. So that could explain why Brittany had to leave Peter's room after only having been there for about 10 minutes. Under this theory, Brittany would have fallen victim to a drug dealer perhaps a deal gone bad or something even more sinister. Another offshoot theory is that Brittany was given drugs by one of the older kids that she was hanging out with. She OD'd and then they chose to dispose of her body. There were rumors that some of the Rochester kids had connections in the Myrtle beach area because they had once lived there or lived in the area and may have had friends or associates nearby. A possible second theory is that Brittany was the victim of human trafficking. Yeah. Don Drexel has stated she believes this is the case, and she has even gone so far to suggest that she believes that the kids on the trip with Brittany, including Peter and his friends, I, I, I shouldn't say including, I think this is straight up pointing to Peter and his friends, right. deliberately set Brittany up for trafficking to profit in some way a plan that was hatched back in Rochester and that they took Brittany to club kryptonite. Uh, the group was just really taking her there to show her off to potential buyers. Now under this theory on Saturday night, Peter would have texted Brittany saying, come here to get your flip flops. And Jen would then have possibly lured her back out to the strip saying she needed her shorts 
Right. This would put Brittany in a vulnerable position, wandering on the strip after dark by herself. There is debate about how extensive human trafficking is in South Carolina, but there were news stories and reports that there is significant human trafficking business in that area. In fact, a member of a task force set up to investigate human trafficking in South Carolina says that there are obvious reasons that authorities in the area deny that human trafficking is a problem, citing the tourist industry would be devastated by stories of young women being abducted. In any event, the behavior of Brittany's friends with relocating hotel rooms while leaving Brittany to fend for herself and checking out and leaving town in the middle of the night does make them look awfully suspicious. Right, but if if the FBI is contacting Peter and they're probably getting his phone records, so you'd think that by now we'd have some kind of arrest towards Peter if this this theory actually held up. Well, and I'm totally on the side of Brittany's mom of, of this thought of let's look at everybody, you know, and of course let's look at the inner circle, the people that she was traveling with, or at least the people that she knew in the area at the time. Could they have set her up on something? It's certainly a possibility. Yeah. The problem with that issue is, you know, while I admire her enthusiasm, I question if these look, this is a group of, of, somewhat kids. I know that they're all over 18, but, but in comparison to how wise you and I are here from the garage, (laughs) how old and these are merely just crumbling babies. But so what I'm getting at though, is would a group of teenagers of partying teenagers be Mm -hmm. so clever to set this whole thing up been have connected enough to set this up and that no one would spill the beans later. Well, and Peter said something that I thought was pretty interesting on the Dr. Phil show is when he said, uh, the other kids in the room with me, Mm -hmm. he didn't say the other young adults or anything. I mean, he said the other kids with me. So I think that kind of shows their age to be clear though, too, Jen, Alana, Peter, all those people that, that traveled with her or that she knew in the area at the time, Actually, none of them have to be involved in Brittany's disappearance for her to have been a victim of human trafficking. Right. You know, when we're looking at that theory. I just think they would be checking the cell phones. Definitely of Peter. Uh, I wonder if the FBI did anything as far as the... You'd think they would uh, get the phone records of the two, two girls that she went with. And from my understanding, though, all those people have been cleared. So they must have good reason for clearing them. My thought is that they have Brittany's cell phone pinging miles away hours after the time they believe she disappeared, and they probably can account for everybody else's whereabouts during this time. Well, it's pretty simple. If I don't even need to know what you're texting or who you're calling. If I could get the cell phone pings from all of those individuals you're hanging out with and they're not going south when you're going south, then they're not with you. Well, and then there's a possible break in the case, and this is coming from an area that we've already discussed. In 2009, in December, investigators started a week-long search. This is in the area of where Brittany's phone had stopped pinging. This search is with 70 volunteers and police officers pouring in from the area. The area is about 40 miles south of Myrtle Beach. On this search, they are using dive teams equipped with underwater cameras. While they were searching, a couple brought in a pair of knockoff Prada sunglasses. Now, these looked like a pair that Brittany had. Mm -hmm. The couple had been searching for firewood for their campsite and located the sunglasses on the Santee Riverbank. The sunglasses looked suspiciously clean, however not as though that they had been outside in the elements for eight months. They were tested, and no DNA was found on them. Investigators are, let's say, to put it lightly, skeptical that they even belong to Brittany. Right. Here's the weird thing, though. Could someone have, you know, this is, I'm going to be Mr. Conspiracy here. Could someone have called, conspiracy. called in a tip and then planted these glasses to focus investigators on an area, a new area, uh, even though it's close to old areas. Yeah, or... But in fact, the wrong area. Right, or an individual found these 
in their car and then they decided I got to get rid of these. We are made aware of the discovery. We are made aware that they test them for DNA, that they find nothing of D of Britney's on the glasses. However, we're not, I'm not certain what the update is on these glasses. At no point could I find information to state if they publicly deter stated that they determined that these glasses had nothing to do with Brittany. Right. In January of 2010, there was a task force formed by investigators from Myrtle beach in Georgetown and Charleston counties. The December, 2009 tip was credited for generating new leads. These leads led to persons of interest and evidence sufficient for law enforcement to obtain search warrants. In April 2010, investigators made a bombshell announcement. They were looking at three to four persons of interest in Brittany's case. Police stated that they are confident this tip was leading them in a direction of finding who was responsible. Police would not release any additional information on these tips out of fear that it might jeopardize the investigation. They did state that these persons of interest are suspected of being present with Brittany and knowing her whereabouts. An investigator made one very telling statement and quote, at this time, there is no reason to believe these people knew Brittany directly. He went on to say that no arrest warrants had been served, but lie detector test had been conducted on two of the persons of interest. They did not disclose the test results. Another detective stated, quote, all of our little pieces of evidence, they are all pointing in the same direction towards certain people, end quote. Investigators described the area along the Georgetown slash Charleston County line where they were concentrating uh, as a location of interest, saying it is where the persons of interest live. The information that investigators had compiled indicated that Brittany was no longer alive. Investigators were now treating her case as a homicide. This without having found a body. They said we are on to the people we think killed her and she did not know them directly. And what's curious here, captain to me and, and, and from some of the online chatter about this case right. is what did that word directly mean? We hear them say that twice when they're giving us this bombshell announcement that she did not know them directly, meaning that Brittany was, was she a, a victim of a stranger abduction? Right. Well, I think, Maybe they use that term because we have uh, the finger pointing of people that she went down there with and maybe people that were, you know, quote unquote friends of hers. So I think by saying, saying that statement, it's kind of, it's not maybe directing you towards more evidence as it might just be directing you away from those people. Well, that's why I question that word directly. They did not know Brittany directly. You could... One would just naturally say they did not know Brittany. Right. But when you hear that added word of directly afterwards, it almost seems like maybe they knew of Brittany, but never met her. Right. And that she didn't know these people. Um, you know, meaning maybe she was targeted and somebody provided information about her. But regardless, it may mean nothing at all, but there's a part of me that when I when I watched that announcement and then reading through it again afterwards, it almost seems deliberate that they use that word directly. Brittany's high school uh, graduation from the Gates Chile high school would have taken place on Wednesday, June 23rd, 2010. And her family did attend in her absence to accept a honorary degree for Brittany. Also in 2010, something happened that investigators in the Brittany's case could not ignore. This is on July 21st when Rhonda Massey, age 20, she's from Tennessee. She's walking on Ocean Boulevard near the Blue Water Resort in Myrtle Beach. This is at 4.30 p.m. in broad daylight. Rhonda heard what sounded like a vehicle creeping behind her. Two men jumped from a pale blue rusted van and tried to pull her into the van's interior. Rhonda managed to elbow one of them in the face hard enough that his nose started bleeding in the face. That's right. She broke free 
and luckily she was not taken uh, captive that day. So police, she told police that the van was driven by a third man. So van being driven by a dude, Mm -hmm. two guys jump out of the van, try to grab her, try to snatch her up. Now, we don't know how police made the connection to their eventual suspect, but within a week, they arrested a man from McClellanville in connection with the kidnapping attempt. This is 37-year-old Sean Taylor. He is charged with attempted kidnapping and first-degree assault. Law enforcement agencies executed a search at Sean Taylor's home on Old Collins Creek Road in Charleston County near the Georgetown County line. One of the things police seized in the search was a stolen truck, which they linked to a homicide in Charleston County. The van used in the attempted kidnapping of Rhonda was never located. Rhonda picked Sean Taylor out of a lineup. The fact that this attempted abduction was conducted in broad daylight right near the Blue Water Resort, similar to the circumstances under which Brittany disappeared, Mm -hmm. could not and should not be ignored. And the same multi-jurisdictional task force investigating Brittany's case also investigated Rhonda's case. Now, who is Sean Taylor? Well, (laughs) get ready to be impressed, Captain. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm super excited. Get your POS ready. Actually, um, let's do plural. It should be persons or you never mind hold on let me get uh, pieces oh there we go i'm ready okay okay who is sean taylor since 1994 sean taylor had been convicted of nearly 30 offenses in georgetown and charleston counties some of these involved driving offenses that happens Mm -hmm. some are disorderly conduct he's in charge of that Mm -hmm. but others were as serious as criminal domestic violence and giving false information to police There were also 17 contempt of court charges and convictions for failure to pay child support. Oh, nice piece of shit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Unfortunately, to the horror of many, charges were eventually dropped against Sean Taylor in the Rhonda Massey abduction. Police told news media that surveillance video had corroborated Sean's story that he was actually elsewhere that day when the attempted abduction took place. Sean Taylor came from a family with a, hmm, with an interesting criminal history. Okay. In February of 2001, Sean's brother, Randall Keith Taylor was one of five men arrested and charged in connection to the death of Shannon McConaughey. Shannon was last seen leaving a Cracker Barrel restaurant in North Charleston on January 29th, 1998, she was only 19 years old. Her car was found burned in a wooded area two weeks later, and her body was found in March of 1998 in a wooded area near McClellanville. The Charleston County Sheriff's Office alleged that Randall Taylor raped and shot Shannon and received help disposing of her body. Randall, Randall Taylor was allegedly ratted out by two men who were also arrested for this, And this included another Taylor relative, Jacob Taylor. One of the men told police that the men intended to gang rape Shannon, but, but Randall Taylor had quote gone berserk and killed her. This man changed his story. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, so many times that eventually these charges were dismissed because of lack of evidence. So they don't have much evidence in this case against this dude, except for this other guy, these other guys saying, this is what happened. And when this guy changes his story a bazillion times, their case falls apart. My gut tells me that these guys were involved in the death of this young woman. Keep in mind, however, Shannon's body was later found in Northern Charleston County, the same general area where investigators last pinpointed Brittany's cell phone signal. Even when you try to maintain a healthy diet, it can be hard to get all the nutrients your body needs for long-term health. Care-of is a monthly subscription vitamin service made from effective, quality ingredients that are personally tailored to your exact needs. Their fun online quiz, which asks you about your diet, health goals, 
and lifestyle choices makes it really easy to figure out what vitamins and supplements you might need. And their online quiz only takes a few minutes to complete. No more worrying about replacing multiple bottles when you run out because your subscription box includes a 30-day supply of individually wrapped packets for easy grab and go. All for about 20% less than similar brands at local drug and health food stores. I'm recommending that you visit TakeCareOf.com today. I've been recommending this to my friends and family. I went on. I took the fun quiz. It gave me some suggestions. I start. I got my package in the mail. And within about, I don't know, it was probably a three to four days, I really started noticing a difference in my energy level and my alertness. For 25% off your first month of personalized care of vitamins, visit TakeCareOf.com and enter Garage. That's TakeCareOf.com and enter the promo code GARAGE for 25% off your first month of personalized vitamins. Check out TakeCareOf.com today. Support for today's show comes from HelloFresh. HelloFresh is the awesome meal kit delivery service that shops, plans, and delivers your favorite step-by-step recipes and pre-measured ingredients so you can just cook, eat, and enjoy. Choose from three plans. They have the classic plan, the veggie plan, and the family plan. Each box is delivered right to your door in a recyclable, insulated package and made up of fresh, responsibly obtained ingredients from carefully selected farms and high-rated, trusted sources. There are even lots of one-pot recipes that require minimal cleanup. So you can spend less time meal planning and grocery shopping each week and get that time back to do more of what you love. I absolutely love HelloFresh. At my house, Wednesday night is HelloFresh night. I pour a little glass of wine, I check out my recipe, and I get to cooking. I've become an iron chef in the kitchen. Thank you to HelloFresh. For $30 off your first week of HelloFresh, visit HelloFresh.com slash Garage30 and enter the code Garage30. That's HelloFresh.com slash Garage30. Offer code GARAGE30 for $30 off your first week of HelloFresh. Ladies, treat yourself with Madison Reed. Madison Reed, a company the founder, Amy Arrett, named after her daughter, is revolutionizing the way women color their hair. For decades, women have had two options, outdated at-home hair color or the time and the expense of a salon. Amy created Madison Reed because she believes women deserve better than the status quo. Madison Reed is reinventing the way women color their hair by offering the quality of salon color, the convenience, and the affordability of at-home hair color. You're going to look like you just came from the salon girl, but in reality, you had more me time to do what you love. Experience beautiful, multi-dimensional hair color. It's made in Italy. It's delivered to your door on your schedule for under $25. You can treat yourself. That's right. To, to, to treat yourself for under $25. Join the hundreds of thousands of women who have tried and love Madison Reed. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. Madison Reed would like to honor True Crime Garage listeners with 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit with promo code True Crime Garage. That's promo code True Crime Garage. Check out madison-reed.com today. Madison Reed, treat yourself. All right, we're back. Cheers, me mateys. Cheers to you, Captain. In 2012, Fox News reported that a convicted child rapist was being looked at by South Carolina law enforcement in two disappearances of young women. Detectives said that 51-year-old Raymond Moody had been named the primary person of interest in Brittany's case. Moody was also being looked at in connection with another missing woman, 28-year-old Crystal Souls. Both women were presumed to be dead, though neither had been found. In 2011, police searched an apartment where Moody had lived. This is the Sunset Lodge Apartments. They're located about eight miles from the site of the boat landing on the Santee River where the police had tracked Brittany's cell phone signal to. Right. Detectives revealed to the media that Moody, a registered, a registered level three sex offender, He was in Myrtle Beach in the area the same weekend Brittany disappeared. We know this. Yeah, the day after. Yeah, because, well, he he was issued a speeding ticket at Surfside Beach on April 26th. Moody served 21 years in prison. This is after he abducted a girl from a California playground and sexually assaulted her in 1983. 
His other convictions include three counts of rape with force and violence, two counts of lewd behavior on a child under the age of 14. This is according to a South Carolina state sex offender database website. Now, after his release for these charges from the California state prison in 2004, Moody relocated to Georgetown, South Carolina. This is where his parents lived. He worked as a cabinet maker. Detectives said that they are investigating a possible connection between Brittany's case and Crystal Souls. Souls 28 was last seen January 24th, 2005 in Andrews, South Carolina, and it is believed to have been abducted as she walked home after dark. Despite naming Moody publicly, police have never been able to pin anything concrete on him for as, as far as I could find for either of the disappearances of these two girls. Right now, the, the investigation is going to ramp up here. And this is going to be starting in April of 2012. By this point, Brittany's been missing for three years. Her stepfather, Chad Drexel, announced his plans that he was going to be working with a private group. Um, and this was so that they, he's hiring people to participate in this investigation to help find his daughter. In 2013, Don Drexel, moved permanently to Myrtle Beach to be closer to Brittany's last known location. She wanted to make sure that the case did not grow cold. And while nothing happened publicly for quite a while on this case, things were beginning to take shape behind the scenes. On June 8, 2016, a special agent in charge of the FBI in South Carolina held a news conference. This took place in McClellansville, around the area where Brittany's phone gave its last signals. It was attended by Brittany's family and friends. Now, it is not initially clear when or why the FBI became involved in Brittany's case, but from the news conference, it became apparent that the FBI had taken over the case and there were updates. Well, if there was evidence that Brittany was kidnapped, then this would fall under the FBI's jurisdiction. Well, what the FBI had to say at this news conference was the following, and quote, what we've come to discover through the course of this investigation is that Brittany Drexel did leave the Myrtle Beach area. We believe she traveled to this area around McClellanville, and we believe she was killed after that. The FBI agent went on to say that although they had not found Brittany's body, mm -hmm. investigators had ex exhaustive evidence that she was held against her will for days before she was killed. They ended the news conference with an appeal to the people of McClellanville. Please come forward. This is a very small town. I think 3,000 people. Yeah. There are people who know what happened, and one small piece of information could close the case. So, going off of the information gleaned from this news conference, how did investigators know that Brittany was, in fact, dead? and that she had been held against her will in McClellanville. So let's try to piece this together from what the investigation uncovered behind the scenes. So in 2016, a prison inmate wrote a letter to prison officials saying he knew what had happened to Brittany Drexel. He named names, specifically someone named Timothy Deshaun Taylor. Now, does that name sound vaguely familiar? Timothy, who actually goes by his middle name, Deshaun, is the son of Sean Taylor, the man identified in a lineup by Rhonda Massey, the woman who was, uh, the, they had a, attempted a, an abduction against her in Myrtle Beach in 2010. Right. So the same Sean Taylor, who has a long rap sheet and an extended family suspected of violent crimes, specifically against women, Timothy Deshaun Taylor lived in McClellanville and was 16 when Brittany Drexel went missing. And apparently this was not the first time that Deshaun Taylor's name had come up. It turns out he had been questioned in 2009. In 2016, the FBI rounded up Deshaun and questioned him, but he wouldn't talk at this time. He said he had nothing whatsoever to do with what happened to Brittany, but investigators weren't buying it. According to the FBI and the local police departments, in Myrtle Beach and Georgetown County, pieces of evidence they had collected throughout 
the investigation also pointed to Deshaun or people he knew. And the feds figured out a way to put the squeeze on Deshaun. Right. They brought new federal criminal charges against him for an earlier crime to detain him and hopefully get him to roll over. Federal and state charges for the same crime are not a violation of a suspect's constitutional rights against double jeopardy. And this is how this situation would work. What was interesting, though, was when they arrested him, they said that he was being arrested for the kidnapping and the, the murder of Brittany Drexel. And then when he got down to the courthouse to be questioned or the police department to be questioned, mm-hmm. um, you know, they were questioning about Brittany and everything. And then eventually when there was a charge, it was about this McDonald's. Which he had already served time for. Right. And, and so because he was a, so here's what happened is they robbed a McDonald's. He was the driver and he, since he was young at the time, he didn't uh, get charged as much as other people. Correct. And then, and then basically, um, basically law enforcement came back and said, well, we could have charged him with conspiracy. And so let's do that to him now. Right. And it's really, do they give a crap about the burglary uh, or the the stick up at, at the McDonald's? No, they don't. They're trying to squeeze him because of this Brittany Drexel case. Right. Yes. And and basically saying, yeah, we know that he served some time, but now we've decided that the the charges and the sentence was too lenient. Right. That this was a very organized and potentially violent crime, and we need to hold him further responsible for this issue. But you're exactly right, Captain. It's most likely put the squeeze on him, try to get information regarding this Brittany Drexel case. So there's going to be a detention hearing in the case of the United States against Timothy Deshaun Taylor. This is to determine if they could detain him or hold him without bond on these new federal charges related to the old 2011 robbery. Right. During the course of these hearings, there is an FBI agent who is going to testify during his testimony. This is FBI agent Garrick Munoz. He alleged that Deshaun was the target of another FBI investigation and an investigation into kidnapping, human trafficking and murder. Munoz says that, quote, several people had come forward and given testimony outlining Deshaun's involvement. Some of the witnesses even alleged that Deshaun was the abductor. Munoz was referring to the Brittany Drexel case. There was an eyewitness named, and his name is Tyquan Brown. This is the inmate who wrote the letter who actually saw or claims to have seen Deshaun with Brittany Drexel also claims to see Timothy, um, Timothy's father as well. Yes. And according to Taekwon Brown, this sighting took place at what Munoz on the stand referred to as a quote stash house. So no one lived at this location, but apparently Deshaun and others, several others had access to this place. And according to the statement that they received from Brown was that on April 29th, 2009, which was the Wednesday after Brittany disappeared, according to this eyewitness, he was visiting this stash house to make a payment of some sort to Sean Taylor, Deshaun's father. He says that when he entered the home or entered the stash house, he passed through it on his way out back in passing through He said he saw Brittany stripped and tied to a bed, beaten, and she apparently was attempting to escape. The the weird thing here about this statement, Captain, is that that Brown says he's just passing through. We've seen a lot of these type of... Yeah, just passing through, man. A lot of these type of confessions where people say, hey, I I have some knowledge and I might be guilty of something, but I'm not guilty of everything that you think I could be or that I'm willing to admit to. Right. Right. So Brown says he's just passing through this stash house, but obviously he must have taken his time or some time if he absorbed all of that, all of those uh, observations, let's say. He says that he then stepped outside with Sean Taylor. And at this time, Brittany must have escaped and ran out of the room and then outside. Mm -hmm. She was eventually caught by someone 
pistol whipped and brought back inside the house. Sean Taylor went into the house as well. Brown says he stayed outside where he heard two gunshots fired. Then he said he saw a, quote, wrapped up body being removed from the stash house and placed in a pickup truck. I don't have any better of a description of that portion of his story than a wrapped up body being moved from the stash house and placed in a pickup truck. Munoz says secondhand information had come in support of Brown's statements. The FBI interviewed a prisoner at Georgetown Penitentiary that heard from another source that Deshaun was the one who picked her up in Myrtle Beach. Right. There's now, also some rumors that there was some eyewitnesses around town, roughly about four of them. Now, keep in mind, this is this is secondhand prison informant information. Right. So, so a lot of times you have to take this with a grain of salt, I think. But we have another person claiming to back this up. So this person said that Deshaun had picked Brittany up, brought her down to McClellanville, and, quote, showed her off and ended up tricking her out. Then there was a lot of publicity from her disappearance, and so she was disposed of. Several witnesses have said that Miss Drexel's body was then placed into a gator pit to have her body disposed of, eaten by the gators and whatever. I don't want to go too much into that. Munoz went on to say that they had several people show them locations where they thought the body was, but it, he went on to say that, look, there's possibly 30 or 40 of these locations where she could be. And we also have those earlier statements by the FBI and investigators stating that if her remains were taken to this location, or if she was taken to this location, it might be tough to find any trace of her after short of a period of time as six hours. Munoz also alleged that at the time of this hearing, Taekwon Brown was serving 25 years in prison for voluntary manslaughter, obstruction of justice and possession of a weapon by a felon. So that's where I bring that up only. So we all can question, is this a reliable witness? Is this reliable information that they've received? Right. The judge would go on to refuse to rule on Deshaun's detention on that day during that course of that hearing, whether they could hold him for a pending plea deal, saying that he could not rule on Deshaun being a danger to society because he needed to know more information about this Brown character and his reliability and whether he was looking for a sentence reduction. Why is he coming forward with this information or is he making it up? Right. Deshaun's attorney said two of the men supposedly named by Brown as being at the stash house were actually in prison at the time of when this story would have taken place. Brown named several men in his letter. Now, each one of these is a different man, okay? So this is Rooster, Homie, Cruz, Foot, Skills, 40, QB, and Snow Bunny. And now if you could pick out of those, what do you want your nickname to be? None of them. I go with Foot. I want nothing to do with it. Call me Foot. And of course, he also named Sean and Deshaun Taylor. But law enforcement apparently has not been able to identify the real names or real identities of these people that were, they were only provided nicknames or code names by Brown. Well, on some, some of those names just sound completely made up. Hey, yeah, yeah, we, get, we called my, our good buddy Foot Snow Bunny. Well, His lawyer also pointed out that Deshaun cooperated with the robbery investigation, the one from 2011, and he wasn't actually in the the Mickey D's when it was robbed. He was just the driver. He didn't have a criminal record at the time of that Mm -hmm. uh, charge or when that crime was. Yep. So there he's stating, look, we know that he received a lighter sentence than these other people involved, right. but I'm standing before you today, judge, to say he got what he deserved. He actually deserved a lighter sentence because he was not inside the location. He was only 16. He had no priors. Yeah, he didn't have a gun on him. And also, um, I don't know if how, how much you want to dive into this part of it, but also, with this confession, you know, this jailhouse confession, the dates and the times that he gave 
uh, they were able to provide to the FBI, um, you know, that Timothy was in school during these times that he was supposedly at this stash house. Well, yes. Um, okay. So the information I could find was that they could, they could back up that he was in school the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So, but on the same hand, the FBI has stated repeatedly that Deshaun and his associates in McClellanville as being the ones responsible for abducting Brittany, raping, killing, and disposing of her body. I just feel like they're uh, throwing this guy under the bus a little bit. Well, one thing that there's one more thing about Deshaun that we should discuss something that may cast doubt on the informant story that, you know, Deshaun was the one who physically and violently abducted Brittany from ocean Boulevard on the night of April 25, 2009. Right. Deshaun Taylor only has one arm. So when he was four years old, he was in his grandfather's auto shop and a car fell on him. His left arm, which was his uh, dormant one or right. dominant one. I'm sorry dormant one who was his dominant one had to be amputated because of this incident, this accident. Right. So, you know, a, a girl that, you know, we pointed out that she's small, but we also have people pointing out, look, she's fast. And she was, she was a tough, small girl. Right. And so if he did this by himself, it seems like an uphill battle for him. Let's say it's, this almost points out to, it's like, you know, fight in a battle with one arm tied behind your back. Yeah, literally it is. But the thing is though, it also points to the possibility of here's my thing. Uh -huh. It actually, I think points a little bit more towards this statement being possibly true, meaning that there were several others, if not many others that were involved in this on some level. And what I mean by that is we have this situation with Deshaun having one arm, but we also have the situation that you pointed out about him being in school during the time that she was held captive, let's say, mm -hmm. if the FBI theory is correct. This is, you know, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So, but according to the story and according to that information, even if he did go to school on that Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, there is nothing to say that Deshaun couldn't have left her in the hands of some of his co-conspirators. I agree with all that, but don't we have the one girl that was almost abducted and she is basically saying uh, Deshaun's father was the one that tried to grab her? That's correct. But then we've proven that that wasn't a true statement. So I think there's a lot of people that are trying to throw people under the bus. And then you mentioned Brittany's stepfather hiring the private investigators and the private team so then they came out with statements later saying that they handed a flyer to Deshaun and that he crumbled it up and threw it back at him, Yeah, uh, which was never proven to be true. And they also claimed that they followed him back to around the same area where Brittany's DNA was found. Mm -hmm. You know, of course they're going to follow him back to roughly the area where her DNA was found. Well, one, we have no report that DNA was found we're talking about a very small town. So to even say he's a block away from it or whatever, that doesn't prove anything. Well, and I'm glad you pointed that out because the only thing that I could find captain was that we have, we have Chad Drexel. He's the one that publicly posted a statement that he knows of DNA evidence, specifically Brittany's DNA mm -hmm. that is in investigators possession and that can be linked to Deshaun. And like you right, and there's no proof of this. We're, we're there's also, no proof of it even existing. Right. But we also have a guy that has co cooperated with FBI said full on out after this long interview, I will, I will do anything they want me to do. Anything that they think I can help with to get answers. I will do. And I'll continue to do. That's what he's done. He's taken a lie detector um, that now they haven't came out and fully said, Hey, he took a lie detector and he passed it. But when he took the lie detector, that was, that was a couple of years ago. So if I don't know, it's, it just seems, this seems kind of like a crazy witch hunt and it all stems from, 
uh, jailhouse confession? I don't know that it does. And, and, and I'll get into my thoughts on that here in a little bit. I want to kind of go to bat for, for Chad Drexel here for a second. The reason, you know, I say what he's, his statement about the DNA should be taken with a grain of salt. And this is because obviously he's a grieving father who until she is found, he will unfortunately forever be a grieving father, grieving his daughter's disappearance and possible death. Mm-hmm. Um, so may, could he have heard something from investigators Could investigators have suggested to him that there's a possibility that there might be DNA somewhere and maybe he kind of latched onto that hope and and ran with it a little bit. That's certainly a possibility. Um, the thing though is regarding the DNA, if that were true, if there were actual evidence of Brittany's DNA that could be linked to Timothy Deshaun Taylor, Mm -hmm. He would have been arrested. Deshaun Taylor would have been arrested, not just pressured with the threat of unrelated criminal charges. He would have actually have been arrested for that. Now, where you point out that that the only link to this is a prison informant. Yes, that's true in some sense. The other truth, though, that's out there, and this is Deshaun Taylor's words. You know, why were you initially spoke to in 2009? And then all these years later, there's information coming out that you might have been in connection with the stash house and that you were in connection with Brittany's disappearance. Well, his own words are, I was questioned in 2009 from his understanding, or at least what he tells the media is that he was told that everyone in McClellanville was being questioned back in 2009, because like you pointed out, this is not a heavily populated area. Right. And when you have the, the last pinpointed pings of her cell phone are in this area and you have a small population to deal with, it's fairly easy for them to do just what he believes or what he says to media and question everyone there. So while we do have this connection through the prison informant, if Deshaun Taylor's words are correct, well, actually his words don't even have to be correct. There is some evidence to show that there is a McClellanville connection, which we know him to have been part of that community. And it's a small population, that community. Right. The other tricky thing here too, captain is that, and this is just me making leaps on my own, but you know, where people question, could he have abducted her by himself? I want to throw this little tidbit in there. We have this young man who at one time he was a high school athlete. Mm -hmm. This is a person that has obviously learned to overcome the disability of having one arm. He was a high school athlete. He had went to school to be a auto mechanic. And this was a job that he performed and he worked for his father. The information I have here is that he worked for his father and his father owned some kind of tow truck company, some kind of towing company. I'm I'm making a bit of a leap here, but it's not too far fetched to believe that this guy, whether it be Deshaun Taylor or his father Sean Taylor, mm-hmm. one of them could have been driving a tow truck, saw a girl walking by herself, and stopped and offered a ride. And she could have seen the tow truck with the business printed on the side of the door and felt some sense of security, some sense of oh maybe I could get in here or at least long enough to engage in conversation to which somebody would, would have the, uh, the unfortunate opportunity to abduct her. Yeah. And my argument there would, we, we have thousands of people on this trip. I think they would would have a lot more eyewitnesses talking about a tow truck. I think I point, I only point that out because I think it's food for thought and I've not seen it pointed out anywhere else. No, no, I think, I, I think at this point, everything needs to be looked at. So, I mean, it's definitely a, a angle that I haven't heard. And we have no eyewitnesses at this point anyway. So that, that leads us to a good, a good summation of this, because where are we now, captain? Mm-hmm. Well, this year in January of 2018, Deshaun was scheduled to be sentenced for the federal charges. Again, these not related to Brittany's case. 
But this hearing was delayed due to an unspecific matter of law. Mm -hmm. So since then, Deshaun has made a motion to change attorneys. Actually, from, from what I saw online and on TV, I thought his attorney was giving him pretty good representation, but right. I'm not the client. It's not up to me to decide if he thinks he's receiving good representation. So anyway, he's decided to change attorneys. This lawyer switch has delayed the, um, the hearing further. The government has recommended a sentence of 10 to 20 years against Deshaun Taylor. I believe that the plea deal also provides. So they, they are offering him straight up a plea deal. Mm -hmm. If you have information on other cases, specifically Brittany Drexel's case, we might be able to work something out here. And I believe that this plea deal also provides that if a third person, if a third party comes forward and provides substantial assistance, this being information about Brittany's case on right. Deshaun's behalf, if they can back up his, his statement, then this would further reduce the sentence. Brittany's mother, Dawn, since this has gone down, has remarried. She said to the media in February of 2018, quote, to us, it looks like it's not going anywhere. This is her referring to the investigation. Mm -hmm. She said her phone calls to investigators haven't been returned lately, and now she's retaining private investigators of her own to find out once and for all where Brittany is. All right, so I want to be clear on something. So I call him Timothy Taylor because everything that I read this whole week, that's what they call well, him. You, you, you are not right. Or I mean, you're not right. You are not <laughs> wrong. In fact, right. I was thinking of my, my uh, phrase there, you are exactly right, because technically that's his legal name, Timothy right. Taylor. But just to be clear, we're talking about the same person, Timothy Deshaun Taylor. Right. So first of all, I, I believe in fully in my heart that this double jeopardy uh, McDonald's charge is complete horse shit. And this would not have happened if he was a white, uh, white kid with some money, um, that just, just wouldn't happen. I stand by that comment every day of the week. I now, I do believe that this informant is telling a story he heard. And I think there is some truth to it. I think the players, involved in the story i don't think there's a lot of truth there but it's such a small town we have her cell phone pings we have these alligator pit areas it makes sense the story makes sense i just don't think they have the right um players involved in the story or the right characters involved in the story correct yeah that i mean that's very interesting for for several reasons because one thing and this is just mind you, this is just an inference that I made, but it seems to be that the portion. Okay. Here's what I really want to happen in this case. If I could pick one thing, you know, that, you know, of course, without, without finding Brit Brittany, that's not an option, let's say. Right. But if I had a genie and a lamp and I could make one request, it would be to get to either confirm or obliterate this story. Because I think right now, this is really holding up the investigation. And I think that that might be why Brittany's mother has not heard from investigators. I think that they are fully immersed in this potential uh, informant that they've heard from. And I think that they are fully diving into this portion of the investigation. And I think until this story can either be confirmed or removed from the case, it's going to hold a lot of crap up. Mm-hmm. And I think you're right. I think what might be holding it up is there might be some truth to this case, to this story. And it doesn't have to go down exactly how this Tyquan Brown said that it went down. Now, the interesting thing here, though, the inference that I made was it's the, the, where the truth lies in this seems to be that law enforcement thinks that this is a real story because they seem to believe this is an actual stash house. Okay, so local law enforcement and FBI, that's the first part of the story that you can go ahead and confirm that this guy's telling you the truth or outright lying. Right. You go to the location that he claims is called a stash house, you go there, and if it's known by local law enforcement to be just that, well, there there might be some truth to this guy's story. 
Right, and and also if you do any tests and you find any DNA from from Brittany there, then obviously that's another part of the story that's correct. And I would also like to know what law enforcement means by uh, Taylor, Deshaun Taylor, whether it be him or his father or both had, quote, access to this stash house. What does that mean? Does that mean access in the sense that just anybody could walk in there? Mm -hmm. Or does that mean that specific people only had access to this stash house? Here's where I hold out some hope, though, that this story is wrong. And not that I don't want this to be solved, but the description of that story and, you know, it's so horrific that you personally, I don't want the story to be right. Where I hold out some hope that that story is not correct is that I would think that if they could identify this as being a stash house. Now, mind you, I do understand that it's seven, eight years later that you would think if things went down the way that it was described by that prison informant in that, in that home, in that house, that they would have some proof of that later. And it doesn't seem to be the case. Mm -hmm. If so, we've not heard anything. Even though law enforcement said that they ruled out everybody that Brittany knew from Rochester, I need to know where their cell phone pings happen. And I think if they could provide that information to the public, then you can lay to rest those people being any suspects or any person of interest. And I hope and pray that there is some movement on this case very soon for the Drexel family. If you are a podcast head, you know who you are if you listen to podcasts. First of all, all of our episodes from episode one to now is free on the Stitcher app. But if you're a podcast head, then you want to check out Stitcher Premium. What is Stitcher Premium? Stitcher Premium is the Netflix for podcasting. You pay, I think it's $4.99 a month, but you get bonus material. You get our bonus show off the record, but you get a bunch of other bonus shows from other podcasts great podcasters. So if you don't have Stitcher Premium, it's very